Okay, while well, everyone is connecting, um, welcome, welcome everyone um, to the Disclarin Cafe. Um, I'm your host today, and I'm actually going to give the floor to um, to Pavel later, uh, as we are going to have a. Uh, the topic of today is uh, is brought to you by the Claren Legal and Ethical Issues Committee. I'm Antal van der Bos. I'm a member of the board of directors. Uh, the Claren Cafe um, is an interactive space, uh, virtual but very cafe-like, where you can have discussions. We can all have discussions among us, uh, experts, lecturers, researchers, students, to share experiences and insights that have a potential relevance for the activities and developments. Uh, within the context of the of the Claren universe, so to speak. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. This uh, this edition of the cafe is organized by the CLIC, the Claren Legal and Ethical Issues Committee, uh, by Pavel. Uh, we'll give him the floor shortly uh, after I've uh, kicked the this meeting off with a short introduction. Um, technical support is by David. So thanks, David. Um, we'll be uh, uh, reporting issues to you via chat if uh, if they occur. Um, yeah, next slide, slide, please. So this is today's schedule. Um, after my introduction, we'll uh, we'll dive into three talks by Thomas, Toby, and Jan. Um, looking very very much forward to that on uh, on related issues on the text and data mining exceptions that we have in our laws. Um, uh, I'm very, very interested to hear about that. But first, first a few words about uh, Claring. Uh, next slide, please. So there is a video that was recently produced and uh, shown for the first time at the Claring conference in Prague. Um, also for the sake of testing whether this works over, over connections like, like this, like Zoom, um, I'd, I'd like to, to, to show you the, the video now. So, so please, David. Language is core to human existence and the key to understanding our world. Clarin, or Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure, is a platform that provides easy and sustainable access to a broad range of digital language data and tools for scholars in the social sciences and humanities and beyond. Clarin brings together resources from a network of participating centres in more than 20 countries from across Europe and further afield. All Clarin centres follow the same standards for metadata, so researchers can combine datasets and tools regardless of their location. Martha, a historian from Denmark, is doing research on World War II. With Clarin's Virtual Language Observatory, she can browse a list of resources filtered by year, language, country and more. Finally, she's found what she's been looking for, a set of voice recordings from France and a digital collection of German newspapers. Paul, a political scientist from the Czech Republic, is interested in gender issues. In just a few clicks, he can access a vast collection of expertly curated parliamentary debates from many different countries. He takes advantage of Clarin's text mining tools to explore differences in language use between male and female politicians. As some Clarin tools are easy to use, they can also be integrated into lectures and seminars. With a single sign-on, all these resources are just a few clicks away. Many of these data sets and tools are open access, are available in many different languages, and include not only text, but also speech and video. In addition, researchers can safely deposit their own data sets and tools in Clarin's repositories, where they're easily findable and citable. Claren can help with developing research data management plans and actively support small and large projects in the network in collaboration with their host institutions, helping to turn innovative research ideas into reality. The list of people who can benefit from what Claren has to offer is almost endless. For example, anthropologists, linguists and political scientists, teachers and students, software developers, clinicians, journalists, translators, and museum curators. The virtual nature of the infrastructure also means that it's easy to collaborate with other scholars and experts in the Claren community. Claren contributes to easy access by making all resources FAIR. FAIR means that data and tools are findable through Claren's discovery portals, are accessible through a single sign-on, are interoperable thanks to Claren's promotion of open science standards, and are reusable 
because Clarin ensures that its users know what they can and cannot do with any given dataset. Broaden your perspective. Discover Clarin today. Thank you. Thanks, uh, David. Um, this is wonderful. Uh, the link to the video is shared so that you can share it further when someone asks you the question, what is Clarin? So Clarin is the common language resources and technology infrastructure. Uh, it has uh, ERIC status, so status as a European Research uh, Infrastructure Consortium. Uh, since 2012, uh, we've been a landmark um, uh, ERIC since 2016, which means we're in the front line of developments. We're always considered one of the key uh, ERICs uh, in, in Europe, seen over all uh, domains. Um, we uh, provide easy and sustainable access for scholars in the humanities and social sciences as our first focus uh, audience, uh, but we also definitely beyond to digital language data in a written, spoken, or multimodal form. And uh, we also offer advanced tools, access to advanced tools to discover, exploit, annotate, um, analyze <coughs> data and combining them. Wherever they are located, um, that's also because we've set up a single sign-on uh, environment uh, that gives access to all of this. Um, Clarin aims to serve as an ecosystem for uh, knowledge sharing and training. It's one of the uh, uh, research infrastructures in the European uh, SSH cluster or SCI cluster, um, as it's sometimes called. Um, we are a part of the European Open Science Cloud, the EOSC. Um, and uh, this, this means we're an integral part of the, uh, the European infrastructure um, uh, ecosystem. And the next slide, please. So today, Clarin is a distributed network of uh, 70 centers, no less than 70 centers <laughs> across 22 member uh, countries, member states. There's also two observer countries, the UK and uh, South Africa. There's one third party in the, in the US. Um, so this is a, a big network uh, with lots of uh, different centers, uh, several uh, countries with, uh, with several centers in, in, uh, in the country. Next slide, please. So uh, there is a technical infrastructure and a knowledge infrastructure. I think that's, uh, that always characterizes well how, how Clarin uh, is, uh, is set up. So the technical infrastructure is um, a place where metadata from tools and, uh, and resources are harvested. Um, the tools uh, are supposed to be fair and uh, made available according to the fair principles, uh, which allows us to harvest the metadata, make this uh, metadata searchable through our, our virtual language observatory, the VLO, uh, .clarin.eu. Um, and uh, we also offer a direct connection uh, through what we call the switchboard to uh, actual services. So you can just upload texts and have them analyzed in uh, in various different ways through the language resource switchboard. Next slide, please. Uh, the knowledge infrastructure, on the other hand, is um, well, it's, it's it's what we do here. We uh, we meet, uh, we exchange uh, knowledge and expertise. Um, we do this in, in various ways, uh, and you can also make use of that uh, if you have an initiative lying around for. Uh, for for small scale funding, uh, if you want to um, uh, register uh, your courses, be, be sure to check uh, the the digital humanities course registry that we set up together with Daria. We have our annual conference that was recently held in Prague, which was a great uh, event uh, where finally we could meet in the in, in the flesh again. There's video channels. There's a tour de Clarin. Um, there's a lot of activity uh, supported by the uh, by the Clarin office. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the CLIC, uh, the, the Committee for Legal and Ethical Issues, um, is one of the, the, the committees that, that the, the, the Claren Eric has set up. Um, there's a couple of uh, links here. There's a legal information platform that this uh, committee has, uh, has uh, set up. Um, so there's a lot of information there, a lot of good, high quality information, I must, uh, I must say. Um, there's further reading. Um, and there's a lot of ongoing things. That's one. That's the prime reason we are together today for the cafe. And just to to mention uh, previous cafes, um, uh, there was one in March on the rights of data subjects and language resources, and one in October 
uh, I guess that's that's uh, why we call this the year after today. There was already a cafe on the tax and data mining exceptions in the directive of copyright in the digital single market. So uh, there's other cafes uh, as well. So if you if you really like this uh, this format and uh, put them in your agenda, uh, register uh, for them. They will they are updated in the link that uh, Francesco just posted in the chat. Uh, next slide, please. So we're now at the cafe. I I hand over to uh, to uh, Pavel. Um, so please, uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Antal, for this kind introduction. Uh, so as uh, announced by Antal, this is not our first rodeo. This is our uh, third cafe. By our, I mean uh, a cafe organized by our committee, the CLIC, Clarin Legal and Ethical Issues Committee. Uh, and it's the second cafe on uh, text and data mining exceptions. Uh, and uh, the first cafe was, of course, very interesting because it was mostly me speaking. Uh, and I didn't want to uh, make the same mistake this time. So uh, this time I will only moderate and um, uh I have managed to invite a really great lineup of uh, speakers. Still, if you're interested in the first cafe, which is more like a general introduction to uh, text and data mining exceptions, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, so if you missed the first cafe, uh, if you missed the, if, if you have missed the first cafe and you would like to catch up, uh, if you have access to YouTube, um you are good um today um our cafe is entitled has the pony become a horse uh you might be wondering why such a weird title for a uh for an event on uh copyright law well um uh, i remember uh when i joined the language community and I started working professionally on uh, legal issues in language resources. The year was 2012 uh, and we were uh, starting to timidly suggest uh, to legislators that we need an exception for text and data mining pur purposes. Uh, I think in 2013, there was a stakeholders dialogue uh, entitled Licenses for Europe, where the European Commission was trying to uh, find contractual uh, solutions to the problem of access to uh, research data. This failed. Uh, then um, the UK uh, adopted a, a copyright exception for text and data mining purposes. Then um, France and Germany followed. Um, and now uh, we actually have uh, what we really wanted to have, um, a, a text and data mining exception at the level of the European Union uh, in the directive on copyright in the digital single market. So I was thinking we were like this uh, little kid who is constantly bothering uh, the parents uh, to buy him or her a horse, a, a pony, I'm sorry. Uh, because every when I was growing up, every child wanted a pony. Well, I myself didn't, but uh, reportedly many, many children did. I think nowadays children don't want ponies anymore. Maybe they want, I don't know, an Xbox or, or something like this. But in, in my generation, that was the cliche that every uh, uh, kid wanted a pony. The problem is that uh the ponies had a tendency to grow up and become full-sized horses and then the child sometimes lost interest in the pony because it was no longer uh, small and cute so um i think we are our community is a little bit like this child who uh finally got the gift uh we so badly we so badly wanted to get and one year later i think it's uh time to look at it and see if it's still cute if we still like it if we are happy if it uh uh contributes to our expectations 
um, about the gift. And so um, to answer this question, we have a lineup of three uh, great speakers. And then hopefully you will have a lengthy and satisfying discussion. So our first speaker, uh, perhaps I, if I can ask for the next slide, uh, our uh, next speaker is uh, Thomas Margoni. Uh, Thomas Margoni is uh, a research professor of intellectual property um, at uh, the Faculty of Law of the Catholic University in Leuven. Uh, he is also a member of the board of directors of the Center for IT and IP Law. Um, Thomas uh, is and was involved in a number of European projects, usually as a lead for legal issues, uh, such project, projects as uh, Recreating Europe, uh, Open Air, or Open Minted. Uh, I personally, as a legal scholar myself, uh, I, I must say I am really fond of uh, Thomas's work, and um, Thomas is very productive. Um, you can find his list of the, the list of his publications in Google Scholar, of course. Uh, but I'd like to draw your attention to some of his papers. Uh, probably uh, among his papers, the one that is most relevant for our community is a paper on legal issues in language models. Uh, presented during uh, LREC 2018. You can easily find it in Google just by typing uh, Margoni LREC. Um, I really think that this uh, paper should be a mandatory reading for anyone interested in legal issues and uh, language resources. By the way, one of the co-authors of this paper, Penny Labrapoulou, is uh, with us today, as I can see. Hello, Penny. Um, um, Thomas has also co-authored co a uh, very interesting uh, report, Safe to be Open, uh, about legal protection of um, research data that I can also recommend as, uh, as a reading. More recently, uh, Thomas has worked specifically on text and data mining exceptions, uh, and uh, he co-authored a paper with exactly the same title as his today's uh, presentation. Um, so yes, I shall leave the floor to the one and only uh, Thomas Margoni. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pavel. Um, I have to thank you both uh, because it's customary in these situations, but also in particular, for your very, very, very generous uh, introduction um, and uh, for referencing to some of my um, papers. That's always uh, nice to hear that, uh, you know, uh, distinguished scholars such as you uh, find uh, them useful. So that's great to know. Thank you very much. This gives uh, uh, the the, the enthusiasm to develop uh, this kind of analysis further. Um, but thanks uh, again to you and to the whole uh, Claring community for the invitation today. I'm very happy to be here to discuss from uh, my legal perspective some of the uh, most recent developments in this area of uh, of law and uh, to discuss i very much look forward towards the final discussion to see together with you so the the language experts how these uh, legal developments uh, have been able or perhaps not to address the kind of um, um, issues and uncertainties that uh, pavel reminded uh, us uh, uh, in his introduction um, if we go to the next slide, uh, um, following the introduction uh, and the instructions that I've received, uh, we'll start with a very, very uh, recursory uh, overview of uh, what we're talking about today, at least from an EU point, uh, EU law point of view. So the main source here is the Corporate and Digital Single Market Directive, 
um, of 2019, which by now should, uh, but is not entirely implemented in every single member state. But, you know, if it... Uh, if it is not uh, in yours, um, rest assured, it will have to be very soon, as long as you are in the European Union. And we will hear from uh, Toby what uh, happens uh, in those countries that were but are not any longer. And perhaps they will be again in the future, who knows? Um, but, you know, the first element here to keep in mind is that is a directive. So it's not directly applicable, although the my choice of words may be counterintuitive. It has to be implemented at the member state level. So your own member state has to pass a law that implements this directive. Now, um, the traditional theory says that member states, especially with directives, retain a margin of discretion in how they write the national implementation of the law. The truth is that the expression uh, rule of maximum harmonization refers to those provisions in directives that are so detailed that uh, remove to a very good extent any discretion from member states. In Article 3 and 4, could certainly be uh, considered one of these uh, um, um, norms. Um, but still, they need an implementation. So the possibility for member state to deviate even slightly is present. As we, and as we will see, um, I have some, you know, small, not, not uh, nothing huge, but some initial evidence that there are some divergences in, in the way in which member states have been implementing this. Now, the other element to keep in mind is that we're talking about two uh, different tax and data mining exceptions, one in Article 3 and one in Article 4. Um, we will go through them in detail, but it's important to understand why we have two and not one. So Article 3 is a tax and data mining exception uh, for uh, research and cultural institutions. Uh, you can benefit from that only if you're a research or cultural institution operating for research purposes, plus some other um, um, conditions that we will see in a moment. This is mandatory, but you know because it is a, a directive, mandatory here means that uh, member states are obliged to implement it. But it also it is also um, 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 an exception that it's imperative, meaning that uh, um, uh, private parties cannot limit that exception. Uh, or in other words, if a right holder or any other party uh, introduced uh, a contractual uh, clause saying that the tax and data mining is forbidden, as long as you are within the realm of Article 3, that contractual provision would be void. Article 4 is much broader in the sense that applies to everyone. So even if you're not um, a research institution or a cultural heritage organization, however, and, and it is mandatory, so member states have to implement it. However, it is not imperative in the sense that it is uh, uh, given as an option to right holders to, uh, so to speak, opt out, or as we will see in more detail, to reserve the right, uh, to explicitly reserve the right uh, of tax and data mining in appropriate manner. So we have this kind of two tiers approach. Uh, we have a fallback situation. So as long as you work for a research institution, so a university, and you are acting for research purposes, you're covered by Article 3. This is good. But as long as you are outside this realm, um, then you enter a bit of a kind of minefield that the very same, uh, uh, um, you know, legislative reform intended to, to fix. So the idea was to create legal certainty, but as we will see later on, one of my uh, claims is that uh, um, we are not there yet. Uh, before we go in there, however, so Article 3 and 4 tax and data mining exceptions in the corporate and digital single market directive will be the protagonist of my very short presentation. But it's important to keep in mind that uh, the CDSM directive also clarifies other two important things for tax and data mining. One is that uh, the older, so uh, 2001 was the year of implementation, Article 5.1 of the InfoSoc Directive continues to apply if it applies. 
Five uh, one is that exception for temporary act of reproduction, um, which comes with many conditions um, and therefore has always been considered a second best in the field of text and data mining because it can help, but in many situations, uh, the conditions to comply with are a bit too narrow. However, in the case of info, of InfoPack, so in a case of uh, uh, extraction of uh, um, indexation and extraction of uh, uh, press publications, uh, it was uh, considered valid uh, for the temporary, uh, temporary acts of reproductions that needed to be done for these indexing purposes. Um, not for the final act of permanent reproduction, because of course this is an exception only for temporary act of reproductions. The, Directive also clarifies that broader national exceptions adopted on the basis of the aki, which is uh, one of the legal terms that we, we use to refer to the body of, uh, in this case, EU corporate law applicable, um, uh, remain valid. So this is something that uh, uh, also uh, Pavel has referred to in his introduction. Before 2019 and before the implementation of 2019, a number of member states, uh, UK, Germany, France, uh, uh, had already implemented in national law a tax and data mining exception, um, but that was not mandatory. We saw that the big advantage of three and four is that they are mandatory. Uh, and uh, this exception was also based on Article 5.3a of the InfoSoc Directive, that is to say the exception for uh, research and teaching purposes. Now that exceptions uh, that exception comes with a number of conditions again, um, one of which is uh, uh, we could say uh, narrower than the current uh, Article Three and Four, meaning that it has to be done for non-commercial purposes. So in all national exceptions based on the uh, on on Article Five Three A you will be able to see that there is an expression such as this one. So only for non-commercial research. Whereas in under Article 3, and obviously under Article 4, there is no such non-commercial limitation, but uh, arguably, although debatably, uh, broader um, research purposes by research and cultural organizations. So. All this is important to know because, as we will see, some member states uh, have implemented their Article 3 by kind of mixing and stirring and uh, seeing what happens uh, if uh, uh, you put all these uh, together in a way that is certainly creative and might have led to a slightly uh, more, um, I usually call this innovation uh, friendly situation. Um, next slide, please. So let's go again briefly through uh, the characteristics of Article 3 and 4, because they share many of these characteristics. Um, first of all, the definition. Article, in, in this case, Article 2 that contains the definitions, defines uh, text and data mining as any automated analytical technique aimed at analyzing text and data in digital form in order to generate information which includes but is not limited to patterns, trends, and correlations. Now, this is a very broad definition. This definition does not only cover text and data mining, but covers virtually any digital analytics uh, techniques that you can think of. Um, and this is bad. <laughs> Uh, counterintuitively, this is bad because if you have a broad definition channeled to, through a broad exception, then you end up with a, a broad area where you can perform your activity, in this case, text and data mining for language purposes, without having to worry about uh, property rights or about vetoes or about authorization or licenses or costs. However, if you do something slightly different, meaning you take a very broad exception, a very broad definition, sorry, and you channel through, as we will see, a rather narrow exception, you are basically doing almost the opposite. You are creating not a new exception, but paradoxically a new right. <laughs> because right now, unless you are a research organization operating for research purposes, right holders has the right to authorize text and data mining, something that before was far from clear. Now, 
Uh, to be fair in this analysis, it's also true that uh, the EU legislator has always declared that they will take a very pragmatic approach. And it's also true that the uncertainty that pre-existed Article 3 and 4 was uh, um, of a type that, uh, you know, in one of my articles, I say the absurd necessity of a tax and data mining exception. Because if we look at this from a purely theoretical point of view, uh, we would not have needed one because tax and the extraction of factual information or patterns, even from protected work, should not be within copyright remit. Copyright theory is quite arguably uh, uh, clear on this point. However, because of the fact that we live in a world that is, you know, governed by not only theory, but also very practical concerns, uh, transactive costs, uh, uh, the, the, the market uh, characteristics and dynamics, uh, uncertainties and the incentives that they create, then uh, a tax and data mining exception was necessary, at least to have that area of, uh, you know, clarity of uncertainty that uh, uh, everyone and certainly researchers in this field needed. However, by having this broad, you know, within this framework that I just described, you, you would have had many different options. And the commission considered a few of them four in the impact assessment. And whereas Article 3 and 4, and especially Article 3, which was at the core of the commission analysis, Article 4 is more of a latecomer uh, through the council, not the commission. Uh, as long as I understand correctly the the procedure that the, the 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 way in which this has happened in 2018-19, um, um, did something different, and in my opinion, something that could have been could have been done much better. The problem here again, the definition is very broad, and the conditions, as we will see, are very narrow. Uh, which are these narrow conditions? Well, the scope. This is an exception only to the right of reproduction, meaning that uh, as long as your train model contains uh, a copy in part of the original uh, data, you are not free to communicate to anyone. You cannot uh, distribute it. You cannot publish it because that's an act of communication to the public. And this is an exception to the right of communication. So as you can imagine, that's a rather big uh, limitation. Um, nor it is covered the right of adaptation, even though that's, and you know, for the lawyers in the room, that's quite obvious why it's not, and probably I don't need to explain it uh, uh, to those who do not know this because it's a very technical issue, but certainly this also represents uh, uh, an aspect to consider. Beneficiaries, research and cultural organizations acting for research purposes in Article uh, 3, so quite narrow, anyone in Article 4, that's great, but with the possibility to opt out. And that's, of course, um, better that it exists. And I was happy to read uh, uh, Article 4 when it was uh, published. But of course, it could have been much better. The possibility to opt out, uh, uh, obviously, it's, it's a big limitation in this area. Um, another important aspect is that both three and four uh, require lawful access. So only to the extent to which you have lawful access to um, a source, you are free to perform these activities. Now, this one could argue, well, it's common sense. It would be difficult to argue that if you have unlawful access to a source, you should be allowed to do uh, to, to, to analyze it. And yes, but think about what kind of unlawful activities here we could do. Whistleblowing could be an activity, you know, a, 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 an employee that uh, denounces or leaks a number of, uh, you know, sources. Journalists uh, would have unlawful access to that because that leak is would be arguably unlawful. So by introducing a lawful access uh, regime here, we are limiting um, the kind of activities that can be done even in areas that you know, it, it could be debatable whether we wanted to really limit those kind of uh, mining or not. Um, a thumb up uh, goes to the relationship to contracts. So both uh, three, and well, four, of course, is, is a different uh, uh, type of analysis because it can be opted out. But the three, uh, Article 3 cannot be limited by contracts. So if you have a contract that says... Uh, tax and data mining is forbidden uh, and you are within Article 3. So you have to be a research or cultural organization acting for research purposes with lawful access, et cetera, et cetera. 
then that contractual provision is void. That's an important thing because we know how much the relationship between you know researchers in general and uh, and uh, um, and uh, um, and right holders are often governed by um, by contractual tools. Uh, sorry, I had a pop up saying that my connection is poor. I hope you can still hear me well. Perfect. Um, I hear you loud and clear. Okay, thank you very much, Pablo. Um, more problematic than the relationships to contract is the relationship to technology in the sense that both integrity measures and technological protection measures are somehow made safe. Now, this is a very complex issue, especially for technological protection measures, because it applies the rule of Article 6 InfoSoc. Just to give you a number. So in theory, in theory, if you benefit from uh, an exception and a technological protection measure prevents you from uh, enjoying the exception that you should lawfully be able to enjoy. And that exception is in a list regulated by Article uh, 6 InfoSoc Directive. And Article 3 CDSM adds Article 3 to that list, then you should, or better, because it's a directive, a member state should put in place a procedure that allows you to benefit from that uh, direct it from that exception and we checked this in the uk because at the time i was working in the uk and since 2003 the year of the implementation of the infosoc directive there have been 11 uh requests we submitted a, a freedom of information uh, um, request to the uk ipo 11 requests uh for lifting uh, um, a technological protection measure limiting an exception nine of which failed because uh, referred to software, which is uh, an excluded category. One failed because the work was uh, available under contractual terms uh, and uh, from a place and a time individually chosen by the right by the user, so another area of exclusion. And the only one that more or less led to a successful outcome was ironically based on the private copy exception that was since repealed under UK uh, law. So um, I think we can argue that this at the this mechanism at the matter of uh, you know at the test of facts doesn't really offer a user friendly or a research friendly um, solution. And finally, storage. Uh, this is important, and it is again a big uh, thumbs up because both Article three and four create uh, a, a possibility for uh, research. Uh, well either for the beneficiaries of Article 3 or those of Article 4 to retain copies of the original corpora for either uh, verification, uh, Article 3, or more generally for text and data mining purposes, Article 4. So this is a very uh, good uh, and important addition to an otherwise, from my point of view, more critical um, dimension. Um, I know that my time ran out, but if we can go very briefly to the next slide, um, um, please, please do continue, Thomas. Please do. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to be very, very brief. Um, I think that if we insert uh, what I told you about these two exceptions uh, in uh, in the EU key, so the broader uh, body of uh, of EU copyright law that, of course, I'm not going to to describe it to you, but it is characterized by, for example, a low level of originality, at least if we evaluate it quantitatively. So uh, even 11 consecutive words could be considered sufficiently original. A broad right of reproduction, the presence of this unique European sui generis database right that uh, in the case of certain specific databases um, extends protection to non-original data. Uh, limited exceptions that we have seen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the first conclusion is that uh, the reuse of non-personal data under EU law uh, is much more, is narrower or much more costly in the sense that you have uh, to obtain authorization to clear rights to determine the applicability of certain exceptions than outside the EU. And, uh, and we derive certain conclusions from this that probably uh, I'm not going to discuss with you right now. But I think that this is an important element to understand. It's not only the static dimension of text and data mining. So um, um, the, the kind of picture that I offered you, but it's also the dynamic dimension. So the fact that in the States, in Canada, in South Korea, 
in Japan, in a growing number of countries, is a lot cheaper to train models. Cheaper in terms of uh, cost to clear the rights, in terms of transactive cost, in terms of legal certainty. What kind of incentive does this lead to, uh, uh, to the field uh, uh, of uh, data analytics more broadly? Um, and the fact that uh, as long as you agree with the way in which I characterize the UAC in this field, we have made not only text and data mining, but the entire field of data analytics that nowadays, I don't know, probably covers 90% of the technology that we use on a daily basis, dependent on two and a half corporate exceptions, uh, uh, Article 3, Article 4, and then I give you a score of a 0, 0.25 to each of the other two, uh, the temporary act of the, the, the exception for temporary acts of reproduction and, and uh, Article 5.3a. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, so here, uh, I just repeat what I told you in a uh, um, more graphical uh, view. Uh, and as you can obviously infer, is uh, uh, a, a graphical representation made by a lawyer, not by uh, someone gifted with uh, 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 any graphic abilities. Uh, it, it is also a bit tilted because uh, I wasn't able to upload it and, and Pavel in the last 20 seconds, uh, thankfully did it. But it, this is uh, part of a, one of the article that I cite uh, in, in the final slide. So if, if you have an interest, uh, um, then you can see the high quality version of it. But the, the main message here, is, this is simply like how the kind of uh, decision process, the decision tree that uh, anyone in the EU interested in, uh, in uh, tax and data mining should go through in order to ensure that all the conditions are fulfilled. And, you know, uh, I, I don't think that this is an area uh, where we can uh, uh, honestly or comfortably say, well, this is clear. We have clear legal certainty in this area. Um, there are many decisions to be made, and each one, especially the blue boxes, are legal assessment, often complex legal assessment that come with costs. Uh, next slide, please. So I call this a uh, property-based approach to data. Perhaps this is a bit more of a theoretical reflections. I'm an academic, so I, I, they tell me that I have to be theoretical in my reflections often. And, uh, and uh, one of our observation in this area is that uh, uh, we protect in the EU uh, non-personal data to a much greater extent than what we do outside the EU. And this may create a series of incentives of market dynamics, of, uh, of research dynamics that were not uh, uh, taken in con into consideration at the moment in which uh, these uh, text and data mining exceptions were written, exactly in the way in which they were written. And there are consequences that are connected to this, both in terms of uh, uh, how this will shape markets, what kind of costs will we create, uh, um, what kind of incentive we give both to uh, uh, um, public research, but also to private research in the EU, because if we are, if we are creating a system that tells a potential startup, uh, well, you know, you can do it in Europe and it costs a uh, hundred, or you can do it in the States and it costs you 50. Well, probably not everyone is able to, to relocate to the States, but someone will. And, uh, and apparently the UK is considering, but we will hear that from Toby to remove that part of the tax and data mining exception limiting to non-commercial research in order to make the UK market more attractive to this type of uh, new technology. So what kind of incentive are we offering globally in terms of regulatory competition is a big question here. Um, next time, the next slides, please. And uh, here, uh, but I will not discuss this uh, for, uh, to stay within uh, the, the time you gave me. But here I go through the uh, exercise of thinking what kind of uh, um, uh, scenarios could follow from uh, the set of incentives that we have uh, uh, um, observed uh, in terms of having a cheaper or more expensive legal frameworks for um, the training of data. Um, some of them are obviously more hypothetical in the real sense of the word, but some other are very, are very, are very real. So the fact that we are importing pre-trained models in a way that, uh, you know, we, we are not really sure what we are actually importing, but because this is a lot cheaper than, than developing in-house, uh, in uh, that certainly 
comes as a very uh, real option or the fact that when i've spoken with certain uh, with with, um, with developers in the industry often they tell me and maybe you're able to confirm this or not that their legal department tells them well you know scrap and mine everything you find online and then destroy every sources because it's going to be impossible to to go from the train model back to the to the training data but then here you're creating a very strong incentive to opacity to the non verifiability of your sources because to keep the sources is to uh, a favor you know uh, uh, to denounce yourself as a potential copyright infringement but we cannot conceivably have uh, intentionally written the law to obtain this result so um next slide please very good. Uh, that was my uh, last one here. There are some of the um, resources that I used to prepare this. Uh, well, my resources, is, they are quite self-promotional, uh, sorry. Um, but if you're interested, I discuss uh, uh, what I told you um, to a greater extent in these, uh, in these readings. Um, I think that my main message here is that uh, um text and data mining it, in the way in which it has been it has evolved from a technological point of view and in, in it has been addressed at the legal point of view um are not the same thing we are calling text and data mining we are applying the same expression to two very different uh, things in the eu what we have done by regulating the text and data mining in article three and four is really to reserve to right holders the, the the right to develop secondary markets based on data analytics and that's a very different thing than saying well we have created a, a tax and data mining exception to create the legal certainty so thank you very much i hope uh, i didn't exceed uh, my given time by uh too much uh, and uh, i look forward to uh then to listen to the next presenters thank you very much thank you very much thomas uh um, so yes, uh, it was indeed uh, a very interesting presentation, and uh, I think everyone agrees that it very much uh, corresponded to our expectations. You have answered many questions uh, that the research community has been asking, and hopefully uh, you will be there for uh, the discussion that will follow after the two remaining presentations and the next presentation is um, from a practitioner. So the first presentation was from an academic. The second one will be from a practicing lawyer and not any lawyer, uh, not just any lawyer. It will be a presentation by uh, Toby Bond, a partner in uh, Bird and Bird's Intellectual Property Group in London. Uh, a partner, for those of you who are not familiar with how law firms a work a partner is the highest rank in a law firm and bird and bird for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, uh legal uh world is not just any law firm it's one of the best law firms uh there is and i'm not saying it uh only uh, because this is where i trained uh for a legal uh profession when i obtained my uh my my legal certification um uh Toby uh, is not only a partner in Bird and Bird's um, intellectual property group, he was also um, recognized uh, by the Legal 500 as providing cutting edge advice on copyright and the protection of AI generated works. In 2021, Toby was named one of Global Data Review's worldwide 40 under 40 upcoming data lawyers. So we really have a superstar among us today. Um, um, and uh, what else can I say? Oh, one uh, little uh, interesting fact from his CV. Uh, Toby actually understands uh, science and data very well because he actually studied physics, um, which is not common for uh, lawyers, among lawyers. Uh, so I'll now uh, leave the floor to uh, Toby Bond. Thank, thank you very much, Pavel, for that inc incredibly kind um, in introduction. Um, and thank you also uh, to Thomas for that that, that excellent uh, presentation and definitely a, a lot to think about, um, with, definitely on your, your final slide. 
around uh, what what behaviours are being driven by the the EU exceptions. Um, I, I, I now understand um, have, have all sort of title for the session. I was trying to think how it applies to the UK. Um, potentially in the UK, we've we've lost our pony, but we're we're dreaming of a racehorse. So uh, mm. I don't know if that that metaphor fits in with the title. We'll see we'll see whether that makes sense when I get to the end of um end of my section. But I was going to cover the past, the present, and the future in the UK. What what's happened? Where we are now and where we're going, and then I'm going to finish with just a few thoughts on, um, yeah, um, basically just fun things. That I think that I've I've been thinking about issues that I've I've seen coming up as a, a practitioner, um, and things that are definitely worth keeping in mind when you're navigating the world of um, CDM. So maybe if we start by going to the next slide, and I'll, I'll talk about the past. Um, so the past of the UK was obviously um, back in the halcyon days. We were a member of the the EU um, and we implemented the InfoSoc directive and we had Article 5 so we put in temporary copies exception and we put in um, Article 5.3 uh, non-commercial uh, scientific research exception. Um, in 2011 um, the UK, um, in such, UK government commissioned the review of UK law by UK IP law by Professor Ian Hargraves at Cardiff University and that was looking at whether the UK IP framework was fit for the uh, digital economy. Um, that review recommended the government should deliver a copyright exceptions at national level to realise the opportunities presented by the existing EU framework. So that was looking at Article 5.3. Um, it also said the, EU, the UK should promote an EU level exception to support text uh, and data analytics. And this should allow the use of the works in ways which do not trade on the underlying creative and expressive properties of the works. Um, and it also said the government should legislate to ensure that these and other exceptions uh, are protected from override by contract. So in um, 2014, as Thomas has referred to, uh, the government introduced a new exception, Section 29A of our Copyright Designs and Patents Act, um, which was based on Article 5.3 of the Information society directive and the key features were someone with lawful access of a work could make copies of the work if the copy was made to carry out computational analysis of anything recorded in the work and if it was done solely for the purposes of non-commercial research now there's a requirement for copy to be accompanied by sufficient acknowledgement that was something which came from uh, 5.3 and also there was uh, in section 29A5 um, contractual terms prohibiting this type of TDM became unenforceable. Now, very helpfully, um, in Oct this was uh, done in uh, June 2014. In October 2014, the UK Intellectual Property Office published some guidance. So if we go to the next slide, I'll talk about what they said in that guidance. So this was a guidance to researchers. It talked about lawful access. So it explained lawful access is where researchers have the legal right to access a copyright work to read it. And they gave the example of subscription to a journal or database or material published under open licenses or Creative Commons, or in the UK, we have open government licenses. So they explained what they meant by lawful access. If we go to the next slide. They talked about contractual restrictions on TDM. So they said restrictions which um, have the effect of making the exception not possible to use um, became unenforceable. And they also discussed transitional provision. So they explained that this applies to its license terms, which are already in place uh, before the entry into force of the exception in 2014. So if your license was broader than the exception gave you broader rights that carried on in place, you still enjoyed those broader rights. But if you had narrower rights under your existing license, the exception meant that to the extent anything in the license prohibited you from taking the benefit of the exception those specific terms in the license were no longer enforceable now although it wasn't mentioned in 29a um, the guidance to talk about technical restrictions on access it said publishers may wish to apply technological measures on networks for purposes such as security and stability and it gave examples of imposing li reasonable limits on download speeds or control um, of the number of times users can access a network in a given period. But the, the official guidance was these measures should not stop or unreasonably restrict any researcher's ability to benefit from the exception. Now, if we go to the next slide, we look at um, 
the, one of the key issues actually was going to be what what is commercial versus non-commercial and there was a few examples given in the guidance so it said well if you're if you're in an academic environment and you're doing contract research for an outside company it's unlikely that's going to be considered non-commercial the fact you're sitting in an academic institution you're doing research for a commercial organization that that's very likely to be research for commercial purposes but it did say if you're in a department which is funded by a, a company but you can still um, choose which research topics you you do and you can freely publish your work then that may still be non-commercial research and the final fun point on this is well what about the use of the outputs of your research so if you you conduct your research for a non-commercial purpose but then you generate something maybe it's an AI model maybe it's other some other type of uh, data analysis can you use that output for a commercial purpose and the guidance recognized that well if the results of the res research are simply facts and not themselves protected by copyright or do not embody uh, copyright in the underlying works then copyright won't apply and there are no restrictions on how or when those outputs can be published and you can put them in journals academic papers and make them available under uh, licenses such as creative commons with no restriction on, on commercial purposes um but it did say it's important to be scrupulous about assessing whether the original purpose of the text and data mining is likely to be solely non-commercial and that that's going to be the tricky question is if you have a view to potentially the reuse of results for a commercial purpose, does that make the underlying research for a commercial purpose? And that's always going to be fact specific and will be a, a difficult conversation to, to navigate. Now that was the, the guidance. I think it broadly it was accepted. It was, it was reasonably useful and the UK had been continuing. Although I know some people have, have been saying there were some areas, definitely things around commercial, non-commercial, which still needed a bit, bit more clarification. But maybe if we move on to the next slide, we can talk about the future. Now, the UK, in, it, in its wisdom, um, decided to leave uh, the European Union and the transition date for the Digital Single Market Copyright Directive fell after the end of the Brexit transition period. Now, the UK government could have chosen to implement the DSM Directive, but it said it wasn't going to. So the end result is we lost our pony. Um, Article 3 and Article 4 do not form part of UK uh, copyright law. Now there's been a bit of pressure around this because clearly that leaves the UK just with our earlier exception, um, which is limited to non-commercial purposes. We don't have an equivalent of Article 4. And there was a lot in the, especially the commercial AI community saying that that inhibits the UK's ability to attract um, AI research and development. We need something in the UK to make it more attractive destination for doing that type of research because we're now behind Europe. So in October 2021, the UK IPO uh, issued a consultation. It was on three issues um, relating to generally to AI and IP. There was computer generated works, patents and, and AI, but the, the key one and the most interesting one, I think, was actually on text and data mining exceptions. Now, if we go to the next slide, I'll explain what the options that were being considered were. So option zero was just to stick with what we've currently got, our non-commercial exception under section 29A, and the, it recognized that maybe we need some updated guidance on the definition of non-commercial research. Um, option one was to talk about not actually changing the law, but maybe improving the licensing environment. Um, so maybe thinking about model licenses, codes of practice, basically ways of facilitating lowering transaction costs by making it easier for data to be licensed from data suppliers to researchers. There was also some interesting stuff in there about uh, legislative backstops if codes and conducts weren't followed. So maybe if there was a advisory code of conduct for licensing for TDM, if that wasn't being adopted by the industry, maybe then the government would be considering stepping in. And there was a, a passing reference to uh, potentially collective licensing frameworks and whether that would be a solution to allow works to become available for TDM. Now, option two was to um, take section 29 and expend it a little bit um, to cover commercial scientific research and also to cover database rights. Currently, the exception only covers copyright. Um, broadly, this would be similar to the EU's Article 3, but it would be slightly broad in the sense it's not limited to particular institutions. It would con cover commercial institutions doing scientific research as well. 
Um, option three seems to be basically saying, well, let's just copy and paste the EU's commercial TDM exception. Let's have Article 4, which has the ability of rights holders to opt out their works from uh, TDM. And then option four was option three, but without the option of, of um, rights holders opting out. So basically saying you can do TDM for commercial purposes and rights holders have no ability to opt out their works from um, that exception. Now, where do we end up? Well, if we go to the next slide, the winner was slightly surprisingly, at least to me, was option four. Um, so we do, the UK government has said it does now want to introduce a TDM exception for both copyright and database rights, permitting both commercial and non-commercial TDM without the option for right holders to opt out of the exception. Now, in the um, response to the consultation where this was proposed, um, there was obviously the issue of the balance of the interests of right holders and researchers and commercial um, organisations. And the, the UK IPO sees the main safeguard is going to become this requirement for lawful access. So rights holders have the ability to choose when and where they make their works available and they can charge for their works and make them subject to a subscription. But the ultimately it's going to be if you make your work available to read or to use for one purpose, the UK's proposed exception will mean that can be used for TDM as well and you won't be able to restrict that in your contracts. And it does also allude to um, integrity and security of systems, right holders being able to um, take steps to ensure that. But um, currently, we don't have a proposal. The legislative timeline is is not known. We don't haven't yet seen when, from the UKIPO, when the proposal is going to be published. It could be before the end of the year, or it could be at some point next year. So the actual practical, crunchy details of how that's going to, to work, and as Thomas has explained, there's actually quite a lot of issues that need to be worked through there. How that works, we are yet to see. But it's clear from the bottom quote on the slide, the government's ambition is to make the UK a global centre for AI innovation, and it wants to make the UK's copyright laws among the most innovation friendly in the world. Um, so the ambition is really to, my view is to try and outcompete the EU a little bit, make the UK more attractive to AI research and development. But in terms of how that's actually going to play out, what the specific issues are going to be and how they're going to be implemented in legislation, we are still waiting to see. So we want a horse, but we don't know exactly what that horse looks like or how it will perform in practice. Now, I think if we go to the next slide. I was just going to finish with some thoughts on the wider perspective of text and data mining um, and the issues which come up. And my first observation is that this discussion is very much happening in the framework of IP policy. We're talking about exceptions to IP rights and the circumstances in which you should be allowed to use uh, copyright or data rights right protected um, works. Now, that does give rise to the issue that actually these exceptions are going to apply and the exception and the prohibition on contractual opt out is only going to be apply where the data is of a certain type that it is protected by copyright or database right. And firstly, you've obviously got the question of well, is that going to apply in the language context? Yes, we may have lots of lots of the data we want to use will be subject to copyright or potentially potentially other rights, but it won't apply to all categories of data. We've also got some uncertainty around the status of database rights. The UK, um, having left the EU, there is an issue with the there's no agreement on the reciprocal protection of database rights between the UK and the EU. So new databases created in the UK will not obtain protection in the EU and equally database created by makers in the EU no longer obtain database right protection in the UK. So there may be databases that, that are protected by database right and therefore these exceptions no longer become relevant but equally the prohibition on contractual opt-out no longer becomes relevant. So with a database that doesn't have any protection from copyright or database right the position appears to be you're free to contract on any terms you want to. So ultimately it does seem like actually as a data provider, are you in a better position if your data is not protected by copyright or database rights? It seems a slightly perverse result, but that seems to be the logic of the approach which has been adopted, which is seeing the issue through the lens of IP rights. Now, there's also the interaction with other potential legal rights which can be engaged, especially in the context of web scraping and issues such as computer misuse, unauthorized access to 
computer systems. That's been a big issue in the US, uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and the HiQ and LinkedIn litigation, although there's been a, a, and there's been a very recent decision saying actually um, that may well be a not may well be, be a breach of a, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act if you um, are told not to scrape a website and you extend beyond um, and you scrape a website when you've been told not to. How that plays out in Europe and uh, the UK will obviously depend on the national implementations of um, computer misuse laws, but there's always the potential that scraping in circumstances could engage these type of um, computer misuse offences. And also potentially tortious claims. If you're scraping at such a high volume, you're impeding the operation of a server. That's the type of thing you may think about. Things like trespass to chattels would be the, um, the claim you would bring in the UK for interfering with the operation of your physical property. Now, final things as well, um, and we've touched on this a little bit already, is if the exceptions cover the TDM process, um, are there circumstances in which the results of the TDM um, could also give rise to an infringement of copyright or day space rights? And especially um, when we're thinking about generative networks where we're actually ingesting large amounts of data, training our system in a way which the, the system can then generate content, is there the potential that that sys train system does still retain some of the original uh, copyright or database right, which was in the original content? And that's that's a really fun technical question, but also the legal implications of it are potentially quite significant um, because the TBM exception, as I think as Thomas has already said, may not apply. It seems to only apply to the, um, the right of copying and not to things like communication to the public. And it's also worth noting here, I mean, it, just a few days ago, we saw the um, a class action has been filed in the US in relation to GitHub Copilot. So that's the automated coding tool where you start typing code and it comes up with suggestions. And that's been trained based on large amounts of open source code. And the claim that's been brought is a breach of the um, attribution requirements, um, which were in the open source license terms for that code. That's very much talking about training data data retained in model and then being disseminated to users and the claim has been brought about the breach of the open source terms. That's something we could definitely see in other contexts as well. So a fun legal and technical question. And then as a final final thought, um, and just want to, to finish on, cop our copyright and database rights laws um, are very much based on the principle of territoriality. They're looking at where certain acts are taking place. So where is a reproduction taking place, where is an extraction from a database taking place, or where is a reutilization taking place. Now, obviously, we live in a world where we can run virtual machines, we can do all sorts of things, we can run servers in different jurisdictions and different lo locations. And what one fun point I've been thinking about and also advising clients on is, is there a potential to use a virtual machine in a jurisdiction which has more permissive exceptions to copyright and potentially database rights? Um, to get round local restrictions or local lack of exceptions. So territoriality may also be something that we can look at playing with if we're trying to get around uh, the problems of local laws restricting the use of copyright in certain ways. And with that sort of um, look to the future, I think I'll, I'll end there and um, hand over to um, the next speaker and very much thank you for your time. And I look forward to the discussion um, at the end of the session. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Toby. Uh, it's always good to know what's uh, going on uh, in the UK, even though you are no longer part of uh, the European Union, regrettably so. Uh, but uh, um, I see in the audience uh, several uh, participants from the UK, so I'm sure that they were really uh, delighted uh, to learn uh, that they will soon have uh, such a broad uh, TDM exceptions. Uh, and well, what can I say? Lucky you, uh, I suppose. Uh, let's let's see how it's going to uh, to to work in practice. Um, thank you once again for your uh, time. And oh yes, Paul has suggested. Uh, well, it's. Uh, you know, Paul, such remarks uh, in a chat, one never knows how to read them, but uh, I think kind of tongue-in-cheek, uh, Paul suggested that this broad TDM exception 
uh, can be seen as one of the benefits of uh, Brexit. Um, um, uh, so, Toby, thank you very much once again for your time, and I do hope you'll stay with us uh, for the discussion. Um, and now uh, the, um, I will leave the floor to Jan Haich because Jan needs no introduction in our community. He is uh, well known to everyone in in Claren. He's one of the key uh, people in uh, Claren. Of course, a uh, professor from uh, Ufal Institute of Formal and, and Applied. Uh, linguistics, uh, Charles University, Prague, um, and um, an experienced data manager. Uh, so Jan will tell us something about a recent project he is not involved in and how uh, this project can be affected uh, by TDM exceptions. And I think it will play very nicely with um toby's remarks on territoriality um jan the floor is yours okay good afternoon uh, uh, everyone uh, so thank you pavel for a, for a nice uh, introduction uh, I, I mean this part of 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 uh, what i'm going to say is is more like uh, posing questions of course i do not have uh, answers uh, what what can uh, still happen in the future uh, just an, as a, as an example uh, as we discussed uh, before the copyright uh, uh, di directive uh, in in the Czech republic it has not been uh, adopted yet but uh, uh, right yesterday it it uh, it made its way from the parliament to the senate so we are hoping that uh, in the next uh, few days it will it will land on the president's uh, desk and uh, we will finally have the transposition. Uh, the Czech transposition is uh, just a verbatim uh, copy of the paragraphs three and four. Uh, so so we should be uh, pretty well on board with the other countries who have uh, actually adopted it uh, for, for for their research. So, uh, but but uh, what what I have prepared is uh, something else. Uh, in uh, in uh, in the Horizon Europe, in uh, one of the first calls for Horizon Europe, there was a data call, which uh, asked for uh, projects that could uh, um, that could prepare or analyze data in ways that would serve further uh, research purposes and make uh, make research possible, which was not possible before. So one of the one of the projects that uh, we applied for, and uh, so may, may, maybe can I have the next slide, please? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, was uh, was a project which we call the high performance language technology. So actually, we will probably call it Hippolyta for the outside. And it uh, uh, it is sort of interesting in this context. We just heard uh, from the UK. So the project was originally led by University of Edinburgh and is still led scientifically by University of Edinburgh. But because of Brexit, uh, University of Edinburgh could not um, could not coordinate the project formally. So actually, we took over at Charles University and are the formal coordinator because the EU cannot um, uh, send money to UK anymore uh, be before uh, some agreement is signed between the UK um, and and the EU in terms of uh, the standard uh, horizon project. The same situation actually applies to Switzerland at, at this point, as far as I know. And the, the UK agreement uh, is, is not uh, in sight. Uh, so uh, in, in any horizon uh, project, we will actually have to resort to having the UK partner only as a uh, as, the, as a partner in the consortium, but actually not funded by the uh, by the EU. But that just uh, that that's actually has probably not much to do with what uh, what we what we uh, are looking at from the copyright uh, point of view, um, and uh, but but it might uh, influence where we want to. Uh, uh, do something with the data but but the design of the project was still such that most of the processing will be done in eu in the countries which are part of this proposal which is the czech republic norway and finland and spain um, so probably nothing changes much with this uh, with this problem of having um, a uk partner um, only as a consortium partner uh, the project is essentially just started uh, two months ago uh, will, will last for three years and the main goal is 
to get large amounts of textual data um, in uh, in all the EU official languages plus six more. I mean, this is still not all the languages we would like to see because there are 60 um, sort of at least regionally official languages in the EU, uh, spoken somewhere in the EU, but at least uh, that's that's what we committed to, uh, to get the data from the Internet Archive, which is located in San Francisco in the US, and to get some data which were either originally filtered out of the Internet Archive from, or from uh, other sources such as Common Crawl, and create large language and translation models based on that. Now, as you know, in NLP and AI in general, uh, large language models and for translation purposes also the translation models are sort of uh, the the main focus of research or maybe at least a very a big focus of research because they are apparently capable of helping many applications which either were not of high quality before or which were not even um, uh, you know which was not even past possible to do. Uh, uh, without uh, without these language models. Plus, uh, many of these large language models which are reported in the literature are actually not available to researchers. Um, and uh, and uh, like um, uh, some of the GPT models, uh, can, you can only use remotely, you cannot copy it. Um, so, so the goal of this project is to actually make the models available to the research community uh, uh, openly and, and, and uh, free of charge and for a long time. So next slide, please. So, uh, so we are currently working on the agreement with the Internet Archive. Uh, we we already have the the basics of the agreement, and and in fact, it is not it is not completely easy because, as you can uh, imagine, the Internet Archive is a nonprofit which uh, has to live off of um, either donation money or by charging uh, for some of the. Uh, features of the of the Internet Archive. So, for example, if we want to uh, share the data as it is, we cannot, right? So, one one of the premises is that we get the data, uh, we work on them, and then when we when we get to either derivative works or some extract of data which is not copyrighted then then of course we can share it um, but but it was not easy to get to this point when the derivative works can be shared even though we hoped for it because common crawl can also be shared so um we are still not in uh, in uh, we still don't know the details of it uh maybe we cannot we can share it but maybe we cannot um give uh those who will who will get it from us the right to reshare it, which would prevent uh, CC licenses, but we will see uh, how exactly that will be done uh, in the end. And of course, we also have to pay because there will be a lot of transfer of data uh, to uh, to Europe uh, involved in 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 that part. So, the total amount of data will be about twelve petabytes. I think the original idea was seven. And we want to complement it with some common crawl resources. Um, let me tell you that 12 petabytes of data is quite a lot of data. Yeah, even some large HPCs cannot even store so much data today. Some others can, including one of the HPCs in the Czech Republic, uh, certainly the Norway one uh, can do at, at least that. Uh, but uh, anyway, we probably won't be able to store the 12 petabytes for the whole duration of the project. Uh, we will have to process it and then uh, then forget forget about the data. So this is uh, this is the current situation. So please, the next slide. Um, the the so this is just a very schematic. I mean, there will be many many more steps available, especially within the cleaning part, and uh, the building of the models might be done in different places and with different tools uh, for different types of language models. But the overall picture is like this. So we will get the data. Uh, from the Internet Archive mainly. We will store it in uh, the uh, the internal storage of the HPCs that we will be using, mainly in Norway, in the Czech Republic, and, and possibly in Finland as well. And we will we will do what we call the cleaning of the data. I mean, this this involves many other things, and I will I will show more details about it. And then once the data is cleaned, uh, it should be much smaller and much e more easily movable. And we will need the GPUs to actually build the the language models. And then finally, both the clean data and the, and the models will be will be distributed through <clears throat> the through various repositories which were 
which were named uh, in, the, in the proposal. So next slide. So here is a more, um, uh, more uh, verbose uh, description of what you have seen on the previous slide. Um, we will download the data, then for the cleaning, uh, we will have to do many things because uh, the data comes with some metadata, but very basic ones. So that's what the Internet Archive keeps, like the URL of the of the website from which it was crawled. But uh, quite often the language ID is not correct um, or, or not not um, available easily. So we will have to do run some language ID on it. We will, of course, have to run deduplication. Uh, the The data in the Internet Archive has uh, lots of uh, duplicated stuff. Um, not that they would uh, make uh, uh, errors in the downloading, but but of course the data is duplicated over the Internet uh, very easily. Uh, I, I'm sure you know you know a, a lot about this. People copy without. Uh, uh, taking care of copyright at all. Uh, so, so this for the for the text um, for for building the language models is is not desirable. So, so we will have to get rid of the duplicates. Uh, of course, for the translation models, we have to identify parallel data, and we have to also identify whether. Uh, these are already available in some other resources that people use, like Paracrawl or other, you know, the European, um, the the parliamentary data, and so on. And then we will have to uh, convert it to some unified formatting for for later use, uh, since the Internet Archive. Uh, downloads the data for a very long time. Uh, the, the, it, it has this work uh, format which they use, but internally the formats are quite uh, different. So we will, so we are trying to to format the data in a in a uniform way, and have also uniform metadata uh, when once the data is clean and can be published, so that people can easily uh, work with them. Uh, this cleaning uh, only needs uh, CPUs. It, uh, at least uh, so far, we we haven't seen. Uh, the need to use GPUs. Uh, so this can be done relatively easily because CPUs are now available in, in many of the HPCs. And this will be also done in the Czech Republic and, and Norway. The uh, We expect, I mean, we haven't run uh, uh, much experiments yet, but uh, when people did uh, common crawl, uh, typically the clean data takes only 10% of the original. The reason is that it's not only getting rid of the HTML of JavaScripts or, or whatever we found on the web, but also of the multimedia content, which of course can be pretty big, like videos or pictures. Uh, so the so the final text is, is relatively small. So in, in our case, this will only need something around one petabyte of data, or which will be the, 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 the volume of the, of the clean data. And that uh, should be, uh, that should be uh, much more easy to, to keep somewhere for a longer time in one of those HPCs. And then of course, we will train these language models, both the language models in several types, and then the translation models. Uh, uh, we have a partner, the Opus MT, which is your Tideman in Finland. Um, we, uh, and uh, and uh, the, the results will also enrich uh, this, uh, this premium uh, resource or repository of resources for machine uh, translation. And finally, the publishing of the data um, uh, for replicability and, and maybe for the processing will be done in the standard repository. So, so we have offered our repository, but also uh, we will try to, to have it in the ELG catalog, in the AI4U catalog, uh, of course, in Opus MT. And uh, we are talking to Hugging Face to actually uh, store the final models because that's what Hugging Face normally does. So next slide. Okay, now I haven't talked any any legal issues, but of course, if you watch uh, what what the data is going to travel from the U.S. to Europe, then uh, between various HPCs and and uh, computing centers, um, and uh, the data will be transformed in various ways. Uh, so there are clearly things uh, that uh, um, you know we we talked about today. Actually, you know how how the how the results can be shared. How the, how the data has to be processed. Uh, this is not only about copyright because, of course, the web also contains personal data. So we will have to do something with that as as well. And then uh, then uh, uh, throughout the project, we will sort of assess and reassess. Uh, you know how much how much free we can be. So we will hope we can be as free as possible. Uh, part of it depends on the agreement with 
Internet Archive, uh, but also it depends on the nature of the data that we will actually get after the cleaning phase is, is done. So this is um, uh, this is all I wanted wanted to say. So I think the, this 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 project is a good uh, use case for assessing what uh, you know what what um, <clears throat> what laws or or uh, you know legal issues apply in 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 the case of such a data intensive project, and what can be done to actually uh, serve the research community well in the end. Uh, by providing the data with, with as, as little restrictions as possible. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope the discussion will be good uh, over all the, all the sections actually of this, of this cafe, not, not, uh, not only about the project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, I do think it's one of the most um ambitious and uh spectacular at least in terms of volume data volume uh projects that i uh, ever heard of uh and i do hope that with the tdm exceptions uh once we get the necessary clarifications and get used to them through events like uh, this one uh, i do hope that um uh, similar projects will uh, uh, flourish uh, throughout the Claren community. Um, so now it's uh, time for what we've been waiting for, the discussion. Um, so uh, any questions? Antal. Yeah, th thanks, uh, Pavel, and th thank you all, all three. I mean, I, I really enjoyed, uh, I really enjoyed this. I've, I've taken a lot of notes, and I uh, uh, this this contains uh, this was very rich. So, so I have, I have one one uh, sort of interpretive question, and, and I wonder whether um, whether uh, you you can you can answer me, Toby, uh, Thomas, um, um, and others. So it seems that. So we, we are mostly, uh, if I summarize it, a researcher community, um, researchers doing work for uh, academic output for fellow researchers. If we build infrastructure, the Clarin infrastructure is for for research first of all. Um, but 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 the next um, but, but but there's there's a wider audience that that can use uh, use our stuff. Um, now it seems that that with the TDM exceptions, um, it would almost appear that um, and this is almost ironic, um, and, and I think think you, Toby and Thomas both both mentioned sort of the, the sort of the probably unwanted side effects of uh, of the regulations that we as researchers have become have have gotten almost the privileged status um, where we where there is more uh, possibly more dependency between us and the industry than than before. Uh, so now uh, industry can collaborate with us uh, while we are free to, to harvest, crawl, uh, collect a lot of data. Industry is less, uh, uh, is far more restricted uh, with, with these, uh, with, with, uh, we, we, are, we are, we are the, the exception and they are not. Uh, so, so is, is this true? So have we, uh, are we now in a situation where we as researchers uh, are in a, in a sort of a power relationship almost, where it's also part of our, well, you could say duty to, to be a channel to the, to the industry um, for, for, collecting, uh, for, for collecting large scale resources and doing, uh, doing TDM and AI on it. And then, and then uh, sharing, sharing the results of our research uh, with, with them, which, which, is not, which is knowledge and, and, and trained models, not, not the data themselves, obviously, but, um, so, so is, is that the situation or am I exaggerating? That's a, that's a great question. Thomas, do you want to, want to share your thoughts? I mean, um, y yes, I think, uh, well, it's, um, it's a good way to see the relationship, um, off the top of my mind, it's true that the um the the directive uh, clarifies in one of the recitals that uh, private public partnerships uh, are covered by article 3 even though it doesn't necessarily 
um, details exactly what kind of uh, PPPs are covered. So it could be, again, a matter of national implementation. Um, certainly, uh, research institutions are uh, benefit from uh, uh, a more uh, clear landscape than industry. Industry has to deal with uh, the uncertainties of uh, Article 4, which may or may not allow or be better allows uh, right holders to to reserve so one could expect that uh, uh, big well structured right holders will certainly make use of that reservation right whereas uh, you know the things uh, that you find on the internet uh, that don't belong to you know to to to, to commercial right holders so to speak uh, then they will probably remain unt untouched and therefore uh, mineable um it is better than before. Again, uh, my my hesitation uh, comes from uh, uh, you know an analysis of uh, of what should have been done and what could have been done. Um, but uh, you know now uh, research institutions know that under those specific conditions can tax and data mine. So perhaps uh, you know my my critic uh, it's more of a as I said the theoretical nature and at the end of the day perhaps. Uh, uh, you know, who are better off like, or at least as researchers, right, uh, as academic researchers who are better off like this. Another reflection is that, you know, during the Corporate Digital Single Market Directive, a, a lot of attention was paid to Article 17 and 15. So, you know, the filtering obligations and the, and the press publisher, right, and the underlying narrative was the value gap. So the fact that we have to somehow uh, limit uh, the power of uh, usually U.S. platforms over usually U content. And uh, you could apply the same to text and data mining, right? One of the ways, uh, one of the reasons why uh, it is only available to research institutions is to avoid the Google book case in the EU. So the fact that, uh, you know, a big platform can mine, sorry, can uh, can uh, create thumbnails uh, of books uh, on the basis of uh, what in the US is a transformative use, fair use, which also covers commercial activities under certain circumstances. Is this good from a societal point of view? I mean, do you live better in a society with or without Google Books? Because at the end of the day, this is the question, right? In the EU, there are less Google Books because Google has to uh, to, to, to to conclude licensing agreement with book holders, right? Uh, I guess if you're a book holder or, you know, a right holders uh, in the book field, then the answer is yes, we're better off in Europe. If you are a user who wants to have access to more information, you are worse off. So probably that's, you know, one of the keys that we have to consider when we assess this, uh, this scenario, Fr from which point of view are we analyzing? I am afraid, and then I conclude, uh, because again, it's more of a reflection than really giving you an answer that uh, you know perhaps uh, a broader exception an exception that uh, would have uh, you know that they show lawful access to me is a very good example it's something that makes sense you know intuitively you would say yes makes sense but the implications of that the fact that you're excluding for example journalists from the ability to text and data mine leaked information that's an obvious case of an effect that you did not want to have and you know when you make the balancing exercises of saying, well, how much should we protect uh, the business model of, uh, of publishers, and how much should we leave open a door to innovation, which is by default to a certain degree um, unknown yet, right? Because it's it, it's gonna be new, therefore we don't know it now. Uh, that that's a bit of the trade-off that I can I, I think it can be uh, uh, observed in uh, in continental Europe now and versus the states for example but you know in a growing number of uh, countries across the globe so not those who have a fair use style exception but also others such as japan which have a closed list of exceptions and limitations somehow similar to europe which nonetheless have implemented very broad uh, tax and data mining uh, or, or data analytics actually uh, exemptions um, and what does it mean because you know maybe as I said from a static point of view we could say well you know uh, the way in which we have uh, agreed uh, to allocate uh, pros and cons uh, makes sense is fair but we are in a global world right 
So would the fact that our mining uh, um, is more expensive lead uh, companies to, to the UK or to the US and, uh, and, uh, and deplete our market uh, um, or our research, both private, private and public? I think these are valid questions. I think that, uh, you know, Jan has uh, uh, an amazing project. I hope a very strong legal team. But uh, um, you know th these are these are the the kind of uh, uh, situation where we will test uh, whether you know uh, I worry too much or you know my job is to be critical and therefore I criticize and sometimes too much, uh, or or you know market will be able to self-regulate itself better than what government does. That's you know uh, you know it it happens. Um, Toby, do you want to add anything? Um, I, I can see Mark, Martin's got his hand up, so I'll just just yes. say a very, a very, mm -hmm. very, very few words. I mean, the, the the thing that interests me is the sort of reaction, the, the the behavior change that these exceptions can drive in the part of the data, those who control the the data, and if lawful access is is the the key, and if you do have lawful access as a, a researcher, you can then go and do effectively what you want as long as it's for non commercial purposes. The the risk is obviously that you won't get lawful access because people won't be won't, won't be willing to share certain data sets with you um because they they know it can be used and then they know that at the other end potentially if you created the model or something that can go off to industry and they will see that as the va the value if they've got a proprietary mindset and the value of their data they'll see well that values it's just a route it's just a way that value is leaking out of my my organization so i can see a sort of behavior change in lawful access and i guess the flip side of that would be investment in and i think Jan, as you say a lot of, like huge amount of work needs to be done to make to get data sets into formats where they're amenable for four types of research whether that's commercial or non-commercial research and there's a, there's a good question around who who does that work um should it be the data holders and should they be incentivized to do it by the ability to license um data in a, in a remunerative way um, and say we will give you access to this this lovely clean data set because we can charge for it. Um, is that slightly undermined by if they give any access to a research institution, then it, it's going to be mined and they can't charge a separate TDM license. So there are there's obviously exceptions and then reactions. So I don't know, those are just my my thoughts. But I'll I know Martin, you've had your hand up very patiently for a long time, so I'll stop talking and uh, and hand over to you, Martin. The floor is yours. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, it actually follows on very nicely from what Toby was just saying because I, I had a question about the um, uh, about lawful access because um, um, as well as being interested in these sort of large scale collections of training data, I'm also interested in making smaller data sets available for more traditional sorts of research and smaller scale research use cases. So, for example, if a researcher wants, um, you know, the works the Harry Potter novels, for example, um, um, something that's still under copyright. So here it seems it's the situation with respect to legal access that's the the weak point, and um, where the publishers can can they stop us taking advantage of uh, uh, the exceptions. So um, it's not clear at the moment. It's confusing, I think, for researchers because it's not clear how you know how we get legal. Um, lawful access if i buy a copy of the book can i rip the drm on the ebook i've got uh, or if i buy, buy the ebook um if someone scans it can they then um share the uh, their uh, digital copy uh, and what, how will this change you know when new legislation comes in um because i think if we could copy and share copyright text it could be you know, it would be hugely useful for for literary studies for example I, I think we are you Martin are specifically looking for an answer from the UK perspective so Toby is in the best position I think to answer um, yeah I mean the, the easiest one is that buy, buy the copy of the book um, scan scan upload OCR for um, for, science, for the purposes which fall within the existing exception, so computation analysis for anything recorded than work for the sort of first non-commercial research, then that, that, that one quite clearly falls within the current UK 
exception. And I, I would expect, I mean, Thomas knows more about the, the EU one, but I would expect it would fall within that as well. I think where the, the tricky point is the, can you remove the DRM um, point? It's those technical measures, which seem to be the, the sticking point. And Thomas, you was, I think, giving some examples of the, the mechanism in the UK currently to say we want to um, work around those types of measures because we think we're entitled to to use that work under an exception and it, it it's really hard and it doesn't work and there, there are legitimate reasons why content owners want to apply DRM protections to their um their material and then the question is is as the as the researcher who who has a valid reason for using it because you want to use it within the scope of an exception how do you how do you get around that um the, the obvious a great answer would be if you can go to the publisher and say, I want to want to use it for this purpose. And they would say, brilliant, here you go in the a non-DRM format. But I'm, I'm not aware of lots of examples of that of that happening. I don't know if other people have experiences of, of publishers or, or other other rights holders being amenable to, to letting that stuff happen. Thomas, I wonder what are your thoughts uh, about this particular scenario in the EU? Do you think that just owning a copy? It's similar to Toby's uh, answer in the sense that uh, buy the copy, you have lawful access, uh, especially if it is the physical one, because uh, but I'm repeating what Toby said, the issue of DRM, it's, uh, it's problematic. You have to look at the, the member state uh, where you plan to perform this action, assuming that this is the applicable law. Uh -huh. And uh, I mean, in your favor weights the fact that uh, uh, article three and four are included uh, in the list uh, of exceptions for which member states and you know i can repeat what i said before is a very long sentence but member states un, un, are under an obligation to put in place a redress mechanism whereby if you're entitled to an exceptions and limitation which is in de facto not available to you due to the drm then if the right holder does not voluntarily uh, offer you a copy that is not uh, protected by that TPM, then the member state has to give you some form of redress, right? Uh, except that it's so com and it doesn't cover software, it doesn't cover uh, things that are available under specified contractual terms uh, uh, under, you know, in a, in a, from a time and a place individually chosen by you. It's not available for certain other exceptions, but it is available for this exception. But these are, you know, it's it's a way of, I call it, uh, well, legal theory calls it a way of regulating by friction. I mean, you have the possibility to do that, to do this, yes, but it's so costly, it's so time consuming, it's so unclear that you just give up and you do something else. So that, that option doesn't really work well, we, we have noticed. But, you know, you take the copy, the, the paper copy and scan, that uh, I think is a school book case of, uh, of when the, 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 the exception applies. Sharing depends what you mean. Um, sharing in principle, uh, you, you know, it, it's, it's a bell that should ring in your head because uh, the exception is to the right of reproduction, not to the right of communication to the public. Now, sharing is not a legal term, so it really depends what you mean by sharing. But, you know, uh, uh, semantically, I would imagine it's closer to, you know, communicate or distribute that copy to someone else. If that triggers the right of communication to the public, then you cannot do that. Um, with At least with the, 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 the training material, the, the issue of the trained model may be different. Something I mentioned, uh, I forgot to mention, sorry, is that some countries, and I know of Germany and, and Italy, have implemented Article 3 by adding uh, a provision to the storage uh, possibility that Article 3 creates that allows the research group to share, so to communicate to the public uh, for reasons of uh, 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 verifiability, uh, the training copies. But in this case, it's 5.3a that kicks in. So in that case, it's only for non-commercial research. So you have the first part of Article 3 that the research purposes for research uh, organizations, and then you can store for verifiability. But of course, someone has to verify, not just yourself. Otherwise, the whole concept of verifiability falls apart. So you can, the big question was, can you share it with someone else? Uh, Italy and, and Germany uh, have uh, uh, added, uh, uh, maybe other countries, I don't know, I only know of these two, 
maybe Pavel knows, have added this provision whereby you can share with uh, identified individuals, et cetera, et cetera. So in that case, it's clearer, but you cannot share for the benefit of uh, you know, science. You can share it for verifiability purposes. So in theory, the kind of access that they would have is not lawful because uh, so they could not perform their own text and data mining on that shared uh, um, information, right? Because they can only have access to that for the purpose of verifiability arguably that's i don't think is a tested case so if i had to be to advise someone i would say well you know be careful because this is another gray area right. another thing a topic for for jan's project i think um thank you thomas actually um if i may add uh from the eu perspective my answer would actually be slightly more nuanced uh, because I imagine, uh, Martin, that you would be interested in uh, Article 3, the exception for um, research organizations, um, research institutions. And uh, um, it's it should be kept in mind that it's actually the research institution that is the beneficiary of the exception. And so it's the institution that needs lawful access to the work and not an individual researcher. So just an individual researcher uh owning a copy of a book i think does not allow you to uh use this work it's like an individual, an individual researcher, researcher may, may have, have a netflix subscription so lawful access to netflix content but does the institution have lawful access to netflix content uh well of course if the book is in the university library for example and the university has lawful access to it then yes in in my book, you can scan it, OCR it, and and enjoy it. But uh, I, I think something that should not be forgotten uh, is that it's the institution in, in this case that needs lawful access and not an individual researcher. Would you agree, Thomas? I wonder. Um, you raise a very good point. So I was just uh, control F uh, the direct uh, recital for because I remember it said something. So recital 14 mm -hmm. says research organizations and cultural heritage institutions, including the persons attached there too, should be covered by the text and data mining exception with regard to content to which they have lawful access. So here the day, it's not clear if it refers to research organizations or the individuals. But I think you have an argument here that uh, including the person attached there too. Lawful access should be understood as covering access to content based on open access policy or through contractual agreements between right holders and the research organization. So that's your a point yes. in favor of uh, your reconstruction, such as subscriptions or through other lawful means. For instance, in the case of subscription taken by research organizations, uh, the persons attached there too and uh, covered by those subscriptions should be deemed to have lawful access uh, um, should also cover content that's free available online so yeah you should uh, probably the you're right if you have your own personal netflix subscription that uh, would probably not cover uh, um, the situation it has to be either the research organization or you acting on behalf of the research organization so if you as a researcher have a kind of personal subscription but because you are uh, uh, attached to the organization then i would argue that the exception applies if it if you're acting as an individual then no it, you know if, if you have a side job as a journalist you're uh -huh. still excluded yes uh thank you thomas of course this is only us speculating we don't really know how it will work in practice it hasn't been tested in court uh but also uh before i uh leave the floor to Francesca, who wants to ask a question. I also have a brief remark on uh, what you mentioned, Thomas, and the sharing part. Uh, actually, Germany um, implemented uh, the TDM exception in a creative way, in, in, in a way where it's combined with the existing research exception, 53A. Uh, and um, it actually expressly allowed sharing um, for non-commercial research purposes uh, within a limited circle of persons for joint scientific research. So not only for verification, but for joint scientific research. And uh, um, 
a large infrastructure project uh, that is currently uh, going on in, in, in Germany called Text Plus, I think will largely rely on this uh, to make an argument that members of a of a research infrastructures are actually if you share something through a research infrastructure you're actually sharing it with a limited circle of persons because it's the limited the you know the number of institutions that have access to an infrastructure is actually strictly limited um and for joint uh, research because by sharing the data you can do joint research uh so i i even wonder if this wording was not introduced in the german copyright act specifically with uh research infrastructures in mind um that was just a comment from the german perspective and now uh francesca uh, yeah i think that uh, what you just said was partly answers my question. Indeed, uh, I would just wanted to uh, make the comment that, uh, I mean, we, what we need as Clarin is to translate uh, all these discussions, and that's why I keep asking you to organize cafes, into uh, guidelines for our uh, centers in particular. Uh, so uh, in a way, we need to be able to, to tell people, because one of the things that we try to convince people of is that uh, it is good to deposit, even if uh, maybe you uh, you cannot uh, completely open your data, uh, they cannot be opened for commercial uh, use, or even if you need to make them restricted altogether, still they are um, preserved in a uh, certified repository, they will be citable, they will be uh, verifiable they will be fair so the, already the fact that italian law and german law have these uh, provisions that uh, in a way i in, if i interpret it correctly uh, make it possible for people to deposit in this in such a way on our repositories it, it is good and indeed if we could push it uh, to the limit that you have just identified, that is to say, for those that are member, and this would be, be a great case for Clarin membership as well. So if Clarin members mm. could indeed benefit from this exception in the sense that uh, they, 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 they can access shared uh, material for, for shared common research, even if it's not, uh, I mean, it's a, just a potential share, joint research. Yeah, that would be indeed uh, a full, fully fledged horse <laughs> rather than a pony. But uh, maybe the pro problem is, as you said, we, we haven't tested this, or you haven't tested this in court. So how far, uh, how much can we hope? Well, as far as you want to advance uh, science in society, I think is the answer. I mean, someone has to do it. Um, uh, it's a bit more of a of a you know meta reflection. It doesn't really offer you a you know an answer of whether you can or should or or do it. But uh, that, that that's how the law is formed, right? Um, and one of the uh, limits in this case is that uh, in the academic field, fortunately, uh, litigiousness of right holders for obvious reason is uh, lower. But at the same time, uh, certain, uh, first of all, it's not absent, but also certain dynamics uh, remain uh, much less uh, tested, right? Um, for the Sui Generis database, right, 80% of litigation is uh, between sport organizers and betting companies. And uh, then we have to imagine how that would apply to to, to our case. Uh, so that's a bit the the uh the difficulty i see that toby has a, a hand i just wanted to say one thing about sharing of data here we are talking and tell me if you agree we are talking about uh corpora so the the original training data not the train models right no no yeah i, I was asking the about the, 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 the original uh data That's, exactly okay. of course for models uh, that i mean although the, it's still also a gray area i think that the general consensus is that people share them right <laughs> You know, mm. it's uh, it's uh, it's what yeah. people do, but uh, mm. I, you know, it really depends how what what kind of information you find them. If you find eleven consecutive words, and I don't think that has ever been the case, and we certainly not now with more, you know, like deep uh, and abstract form of representing data, is the case. So, but in terms of data points, you know, in terms of non, not 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 in the case in where you have a like 
the possibility to have specific letters uh, in, in, in a trained model or words. But when you abstract this, I would imagine that a litigious right holder could argue that, well, you know, that's a form of exploitation that would have not been uh, possible without using my original content. And this is an argument that in certain countries have been um, successfully employed, not in this case, but, uh, but in other cases to create new say my property rights so that there is in my opinion a bit of a hesitation so or, or it is a derivative work that's another big question um that is not harmonized at the eu level so even more fragmented sorry toby no i just got i've got enough i've just got a couple of minutes pavel have we got enough time i know we're, we're getting close to the uh, uh, yes of course please toby please please yeah do. I'll, I'll keep keep my remarks short i just just wanted to pick up on i think thomas and Francesca, you're both just discussing the sort of there's the practical risk of we've been talking about the sort of black letter law and guidance and how, how that all works. But a lot of the advice that I give to clients is, especially around web scraping, is that yes, it's very likely that what you're planning to do will either be a breach of copyright or get or breach of website terms and conditions, or there'll be some there'll be some theoretical legal risk which will arise and actually a lot of the advice I'm giving with clients is talking through what are the actual practical commercial risks of a bad thing happening as a result of that and I always think of it in terms of well can is, is anyone going to find out what you're doing and are, are they going to care about it and then what's the risk if they do find out and care are they going to do something and what's your your legal risk but the, the other dimension I see to that is also that very often when I'm getting asked questions it's usually like it's smaller companies when they're getting investment and you have investors coming in and wanting to understand the legality of what the organization's doing. So that's a very common time that I get asked for advice. And I can see in the research context, if you have contributions into projects or when you're submitting requests for funding, like explaining the legality of what you're doing is very often what's driving um, a lot of the analysis that's being done. But in in many many organizations commercial organizations where they're, they're not seeking funding and aren't aren't too concerned there's a huge amount of um this type of activity happening and the entire businesses are being built around um data taken from online sources or data obtained um through agreements being used for for different purposes so it's yeah i don't think that adds just that additional layer of complexity on the sort of what what's the underlying legal position is actually does it does it really matter sure. And I, I think that this is a, a great concluding remark. Uh, if I can add to this, this is actually backed up by my experience um, in Germany before the implementation of the DSM directive. There was a TDM exception that actually required payment uh, for copies, payment to the collecting copyright collecting uh, organization. And I don't think that anyone, uh, any research organization really paid uh, remuneration for TDM, and I don't think that uh, copyright collecting societies really claimed the the the, the remuneration for that. And th th this exception was short lived, but I really um, think that it was generally uh, interpreted as a wide permission to uh, text and data mine copyright protected content, and the remuneration was. Uh, considered by everyone as as very secondary um so um yes just let's keep doing what we are doing and mm -hmm. uh, um and uh, hopefully we'll not get into any trouble uh <laughs> and uh if we do uh we have some great legal minds here that are uh, interested in our work, uh, like Toby and Thomas, and we can uh, hope for their help if we ever get in trouble. Um, that's that's really good to know. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, some final comfort at the uh, while while we close this uh, this cafe. So so th thanks so much uh, to the for the very interesting talks, Toby and Thomas and Jan. Uh, and Pavel for, for organizing this, for getting uh, these speakers together. Wonderful. I mean, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. So, so just to close off, uh, as host, uh, I would like to point at the fact that the next Clarion Cafe is on December 2nd. Uh, there's even a slide that uh, maybe David can still uh, put up at the, at the very end. Um, that's on uh, uh, this, this is some links 
to Clarin, this the Clarin Cafe on the Ravensbrück project, which is an oral history project, very different from this one, uh, from this cafe, but uh, very interesting uh, uh, nonetheless. So I invite you all to, to check that out and, uh, and follow us. Uh, so stay tuned. So thanks everyone. Have a great, uh, great afternoon um, and uh, an evening and uh, see you next time.